thank you for the invitation to this meeting at this very nice place. And I want to, right, where's the chalk? Ah, I think I found it. Great. Uh, I want to present sort of like a status report of ongoing research, including also some extremely recent stuff. Some of it is just a few days old, actually. So, <laughs> but let's start with some introduction. So what, I, what my talk will be about quantum quenches. In QFT, and more specifically about using Hamiltonian truncation approach. Well, not just that, but, uh, but it's a, a very big part of the thing that I'm going to talk about uh, to understand these quantum quenches. Okay. So what is a quantum quench? Probably many people are familiar with it, but anyway, some quick introduction doesn't do much harm. So we take a Hamiltonian of a system, which is given the system has this Hamiltonian for until some time, say time zero, and the time zero sort of like we turn a switch we change something abruptly. I mean, this something could be a coupling in the Hamiltonian. It could be some local flip of some degree of freedom. It could be some change in boundary conditions. It could be a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to talk about here mostly, well, not mostly, I think exclusively this time about global quantum quenches, which means that I will suppose that H0 is translationally invariant, H is translationally invariant, it's a, in principle, it's an infinite system, which is not the case for the numerical calculations, obviously. But in principle, it's an infinite system. And so this is called the global quantum quench, translationally invariant global quantum quench. And both of these are translationally invariant. And what we are doing, actually, is we are adding some interaction, well, actually, integral local operator to the Hamiltonian. <coughs> okay, what are we interested in? So in general, this is a very big field with lots of uh, different systems investi being investigated, but this touches some very fundamental cornerstones of quantum statistical mechanics. Because basically what, what, what you are saying here is that I have a closed quantum system and I bring it out of equilibrium. And what I want to know is whether it equilibrates, whether it becomes thermal by itself. And I won't go into specific details about why we think it is, this is possible, but there is something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is basically it states a mechanism whereby non-integrable systems can become thermal even without an environment. So if the system is large enough, then for its subsystems, it, it can act as its own environment, so, sort of. And if the system is integrable, then some other interesting things could happen, like uh, not uh, non-thermalization or thermalization in a more general sense, equilibration, I should say, in a more general sense. So the first question is whether there is equilibration, whether the equilibrium, if it exists, whether it's thermal or not. And if there is equilibration, and the next question is, how does it reach equilibration? So it's the question of relaxation. So how does the time evolution actually happens towards equilibrium? You know, what are the relevant time scales? So actually, the, I would say time evolution and time scales and related stuff. And, well, you might actually be, if there is no relaxation, that could even be more interesting. You could, uh, you could have some very interesting phenomena, some unexpected things. I mean, normally, I should say, whenever I turned on a new system on the computer, just to look at its behavior numerically right away, if I turned on a brand new system, I always found something which I, w which I didn't expect, okay? So this was happening for quite some time. So I, I should say there are lots of interesting things if, if uh, 
if one just looks into these behaviors, there's a variety of behaviors. So but it's also interesting to ask whether there are some universal features in these non-equilibrium behaviors. <coughs> For example, such as the so-called light cone behavior, which is that in systems with nearest neighbor or local, rather I would say local interactions, statistical mechanics, there's, there are nice theorems saying that uh, the Lee Robinson theorems, basically, there are several versions of them, <coughs> saying that there's an upper limit to the propagation speed of excitations, and that means that correlations, entanglement, whatever, can only propagate inside the so-called light cone, where the light cone is uh, some sort of characteristic speed, uh, speed here, not necessarily light, but everybody calls it the light cone because it just looks like a relativistic light cone. Okay, so, so these are the things. Now, next question. So this is a statistical mechanical question. So why, why do we think QFT? Well, maybe the simplest way to come to this idea is that uh, QFT, as we know in equilibrium, it's sort of like a universal description of statistical mechanical system. So you might want to look at universal description. However, I'm already giving here, uh, giving here away part of the game. That is, this is dangerous. Because if you have a quantum quench, then an abrupt quantum quench, which you can actually do in a laboratory. So this is really an experimental relevant question that I'm talking about, okay? So the abrupt quantum quench has a time scale tau, which is very short. Basically, you never do anything instantly. There's some time scale tau. And your QFT, as applied to a statistical mechanical system, has a cutoff lambda. Okay, so this is sort of like the time scale under which the switch happens from H0 to H. And it's obviously a problem if, or at least it seems so, when 1 over tau is larger than lambda. I should, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be much larger, even if it's just comparable, that's a problem, because you, you are expecting to excite degrees of freedom which are over the cutoff where your field theory description is not valid. Okay, I'm giving about part of the game, I'm telling you already, that this turned out to be not such a big problem as it seems first. So the argument is, 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 is very, I mean, clever. Uh, this, this, this argument is fine, but for some reason that I'm going to tell you about, this is, this is, this is not such a big problem. However, there's another problem, <coughs> which uh, I think is still there, is that the QFT is not something like a statistical mechanical system in the sense that statistical mechanical systems always, as we treat them, always have atoms. By atoms, I mean not just atoms in the sense but uh, of having some particles. But if you have a spin chain, your atom is basically a site. And on, your, on a site, you already only have, only have some discrete degrees of freedom. But the field theory, a local field theory, is a full continuum, OK? A full continuum of degrees of freedom for which you can, you can, you can go any fine resolution down, down to any scale. It's a question whether relaxation can happen in such a, in, in such a case. And actually, the real problem is that what is a field theory? A field theory it <coughs> describes a critical point here plus its environment. So from the statistical mechanical point of view, you are doing a very crazy thing. It's an infinitesimal environment. And actually what you are doing, you are sitting on RG trajectories and scaling down to the critical point. Okay? And the problem is uh, uh, you are changing parameters in such a way that you are keeping gaps finite and interaction quantities finite and all that. And the problem with that is the quantum quench from statistical mechanical point of view happens that you are looking at the QFT, happens in the vicinity of a critical point, actually an infinitely close vicinity, and it's an infinitely small quench from statistical mechanical point of view. So it's sort of like a very, very non-trivial limit. Um, and there are, there are some indications at least that this, this, this changes things. I think uh, Neil will talk about something like that as well, partially, Neil Robinson later. So that this, uh, uh, our ideas, what we, uh, what we have from standard statistical mechanics may not be directly or sim simply applicable to this situation. Okay, so this is interesting. And 
Last point, why is it interesting? Because this is experimentally realizable, at least so it's claimed. I actually did not understand the second point. Uh, yes? What, so I prepare my system, I go to critical temperature, I go to some, you know. Yeah, I understand the first point about the cutoff, but what was the second point? The, 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 the second point is basically, I can, I can phrase it in, the in relaxation times, okay? If you think about relaxation times in the vicinity of a critical point, they tend to blow up. So basically what, 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 what you do is relaxation time char is characterizes your, your sort of like transitional period yeah. while, while you are transiting between the behavior that you start with to the behavior at the end point. And your relaxation time as you are, as you are scaling your tier and continuum limit, they can blow up. Uh, that, that's, that's the way I like to think about it. So it could happen that the field theory is actually describing the transitional region. It's not describing it, it, the relaxation itself to some uh, to, to the equilibrium because because you just blow up this, uh, this this transitional region basically to occupy infinitely long time. At least this could be the be explanation for some behaviors that we see. Okay, that we directly see. Obviously, if it's a non-integrable theory, I can't I can't watch for this behavior to be exact in the sense it's it's, it's numerically observed. It's calculated with certain expansions. Okay, but still. It, it looks it looks very much very very different from what you do from what you have in uh, standard statistical systems and the basic problem is really that you can go up to arbitrarily small length scales and you scale your theory to that so it's in, I mean I, I don't say I, I understand it it's just my picture but so so I, I just I, I just want to say there is another danger when you think about this as universal description okay there's another danger that you are scaling in a very 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 uh, intricate limit in which you can just lose part of the behavior that characterizes your statistical mechanical system simply because you are scaling it out of all ranges, more or less. Okay. And they are also claimed to be experimentally realizable. So for example, Jörg Schmidmeier in Vienna, which is very close to Budapest, uh, where I am, has this very nice system where, whereby there are two Seeger-like bosonic condensates, which are described, I mean, these are, these are basically some bosonic atoms and uh, they are described by a Lieblinger like theory. But in certain limits, the relative phase between the condensates, which depends on the coordinate, obeys a sine Gordon dynamics. At least so it's, so it's claimed, naively. So this phi variable obeys sine Gordon dynamics. And indeed, they have been able, for example, to see solitonic configurations in this condensate. And some of the behavior which is related to sine Gordon seems to be there, but uh, I spoke to Jörg and, 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 and they also have some recent paper out which says that there are actual doubts whether this is actually described by sine Gordon. Some, some things that cannot be understood from sine Gordon, it's not clear whether this is because it's not described by a field theory or because it's not exactly sine Gordon. But it's, uh, okay, but in any case, there are, there, there are at least attempts to realize really these uh, sort of quantum field theoretic quenches in a lab. Okay, so if this is really a quantum field theory, then maybe our methods could be applied to that. All right. So what do we want to do? More, more detail. Uh, what is punch? Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I have to find everything. Next speaker would have it much easier. <laughs> That's fine. So now with H0, I, I just said there's a starting Hamiltonian on H0. While I can choose lots of states to start with, I can start from the ground state of this Hamiltonian, I can start from thermal ex excited state, I can start from ex uh, other excited states of this Hamiltonian, but I'm just doing it very simple. So I just say that I'm taking the simplest possible starting point when I'm just taking the ground state of the Hamiltonian, which I take to be zero energy, okay? So it's bounded from below by zero and that's it. And what we can do is that we can expand this state on the eigenstates of the post quench Hamiltonian. And then we can obviously write down the time evolution of any observable. It's very simple. There's an observable. Time evolution is simply just minus the 
and T M O M. Okay, it's simple quantum mechanics. You just do the standard Hamiltonian time evolution and you sandwich your state with the evolving state. Okay, so the first thing that it seems obvious that if there is any relaxation, if, if it goes to a time independent case, uh, supposing that there are no degeneracies, then the, the t goes to infinity, equilibrium should be something called a diagonal ensemble. Okay, so there is a there is this density matrix, and what you think is that the equilibrium is just this, because basically because the diagonal terms are time independent. Okay, the question is what is this diagonal ensemble? Whether this can be replaced by something more statistical, mechanical thing? Because this is very microscopical; it contains all the overlaps, microscopic overlaps, whether this is actually equivalent to a thermal ensemble in some sense, in a proper sense, which I'm not going into because that would take a lot of time, but there is, there is, you have to specify this very carefully, whether it, or whether it is uh, uh, equivalent in, 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 a, in a sense to some more general, gen so-called generalized X ensemble or something. Okay, but that actually lends itself to an approach by form factors when you consider field theory. So this approach is very interesting. I hope to convince you that, ah, there is a third one. Thanks, but uh, I, I wouldn't be able to reach more than two of them anyway. So <laughs> I just decided it doesn't make sense because I'm not, I'm just simply not tall enough to reach three blackboards at the same time. <laughs> anyway, so right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what you can do in a field theory, these states are just some multiparticle states. I'm talking about one dimensional one field theory here. So one plus one dimensions, okay. Obviously you can do all this in higher dimensions, but my computations that I'm going to present are in one plus one dimensions. And so these are so-called rapidity parameters which characterize the momentum. So the particles have momenta. For simplicity, I'm writing formally with just one type of particles. <laughs> I mean, in, in the models that I'm considering, sometimes there are even eight, um, eight types of particles, but uh, okay. But I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just neglecting all this complication because it's, un, it's unnecessary detail. And basically, if you have H, the post bench Hamiltonian, then its eigenvalue is, thus, is just the sum of the energies. Okay. And then what you can do, you can, always, you can also expand your state on this basis. So then it becomes something like there are some amplitudes here. And okay, so this case would, would replace the C's. These states would replace the N's. That thing there is something called the form factor of a local operator. In many theories, in many integrable theories, we have explicit formula for that, okay? And <coughs> here I assume already that the theory is integrable. No, not yet. I don't, I don't, uh, this, uh, this, 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 this is very generic. Well, uh, the application needs, normally, if you want to apply this analytically, then you need integrability because you need an explicit idea about these matrix elements. So, but what is the state of n particles you're assuming mm -hmm. to have? It's asymptotic state, asymptotic states. What I need actually is a gap. If there's a mass gap in the theory, then I have this, the basis of asymptotic states, okay? <coughs> hmm? Yeah, I can, I can choose any. I mean, in states and out states are just or particular ordering of rapidities in this formalism. So it's, uh, and then I can extend the ordering analytically to any ordering of the rapidities, basically. Actually, there should be a one over n factorial here if I do this extension and I just integrate freely over all the rapidities, then there should be a one over n factorial to properly normalize it, but, okay. Yes? So I did not understand your answer. You're saying if the, the theory is gap, then you're guaranteed to have a good basis? Yeah, asymptotical, asymptotical scattering states. In infinite volume, you have the scattering states. So that's when it becomes a free theory? Well, every gapped theory has these asymptotic states. The theory is not free. 
I mean, you have non-trivial as matrix, but, but, asymptotic, but asymptotically, yeah, asymptotically, I mean, you have in states and out states. You consider the dynamics, you consider infinitely uh, past or infinite past or infinite future, then, then you are basically guaranteed to have, there are even theorems long time ago, as in, uh, there is axiomatic field theory, there are theorems proven about the existence of these sort of states, okay? So it's, uh, if it's gapped, if it's not gapped, that's a tricky question. But I, 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 I suppose that my field theory is gapped, which would be the case anyway for, my, for what I'm considering explicitly. Yeah, but is this a useful basis? Because now you have to expand this state psi. Very good question. Yes, that's. I, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to convince you about that. Right? This. This. This turns out to be a good basis for at least for, for very interesting questions that you would really like to consider. It's. It's not. It's not a trivial question at all. Yeah, it's not a trivial question whether such a simplistic, uh, because if you think about a quench, and now come. Now comes the next issue, a quench is generating a finite energy density, simply because of translational invariance. Your state, psi zero, in terms of the post quench Hamiltonian, will have finite energy density. So in principle, it's an infinite particle state. Contains infinitely many particles. Whether it is useful to expand it in this way, uh, you will be amazed, I, I promise, okay? <laughs> it's, it, it, this, this works extremely well. But, uh, and, uh, and I will try to explain why it works, but it's a it, uh, very good question. It's, 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 it's not an obvious question whether this, whether this should work at all. Okay? And, and for this question, is integrability important? Or? No, for this question, integrability is not important. For integrability is important for being able to actually compute that sum there. And the tricky part of that sum, uh, by very, whereby integrability comes in, is this. You want to know these matrix elements. And in integrable field theories, you, in many of them, you know explicitly these matrix elements. They are computed, they were computed long time, 20, 30 years ago by, in, by this, all these people, form factor bootstrap, all that for many, many theories. Okay, also, I should give away another part of the game for this, uh, because of these questions, is that, is that C. Knowing C, I will come, to by, I will come back to that, uh, uh, or knowing these K functions is a very non-trivial proposition. Okay, so I will come back. I, I will come back to that. I, I must come back to that at some point. I'm confused about the, the order of limits. So uh, there is an infinite volume, and then we have the symptotic states. And if you go to a finite volume, then we know that everything changes uh, dramatically. The eigenstates are not. Uh, you know, you, you cannot just write it like this simply. Yes. So, and also we know that in finite volume there's going to be finitely many particles on average, and infinite volume there's going to be infinitely many particles. So why are you writing all these terms? Why is it not the term with n equal infinity, which is important? I will explain. Okay, just try. Uh, I, I can't explain it before you see before you see something more. Okay? Yeah, very good. I mean, these are very good questions. Exactly. I, I have to say, I have to say something about that, but I can't say it at this point. Yes, but just. Just bear with me. This is the expansion. You put it in oh, the, with all the obvious difficulties. I already listed a lot of them. You add this difficulty to, to those. Okay? Right. This is this is this is this 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 is this is this is all the problem. Okay? I agree. So what uh, so what we actually do? Okay, going to finite volume is not such a big problem because in because there's a theory there's a theory of finite size effects. Okay? So we know we know we know how the finite size effects go for energies. That's Lucher's theory, but if it's an integrable model, then we have even better <coughs> description for, 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 for this in finite volume, okay? For the finite volume dependence of these quantities, we have formulae, which were worked out by Balash Poshgai and me something like uh, 10 years ago, that work uh, exponentially well in the volume. So we have all captured all power-like corrections in the volume in field theory. So we know exactly so it's basically up to exponential corrections. We know we know the finite volume dependence of these of the amplitudes, and uh, that, that that that's a formula that has that that, that have been already that, that already had lots of different applications to calculation of different things. So it's um, like uh, thermal correlators and uh, one point functions with boundaries and all sorts of things. So so we understand that. The real problem is for finite energy density. How we how how, how we get around that problem? Yes. So actually. First, just suspend belief and do it, and see what we get, okay? Okay, so that's, that, 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 that's where I'm going to need to project something, because plotting it all with the, with the chalk would be, I mean, very awkward. So the idea is that you do simulations with the truncated conformal space approach, with truncated space approach, which is very simple. 
okay? I, I, I realize I have to describe this. This is a, what is up there is a very simple model, at, at least the upper side. We just take the Ising quantum field theory, which is basically just a free Majorana fermion, one plus one dimension. And we do temperature quench or transfer transverse field quench if you are, if you think about it on the spin chain or in the Majorana term in the Majorana field theory this is just a mass quench basically free free quench in a mass ma, in a free mass quench okay and we, we just we just take this Majorana theory which has this mass term here so something like the Hamiltonian is uh, is one over I think it's two pi dx that's that's the standard. I think there's an I here, yeah. And we basically what we do is that we take some M0 before the quench, we quench to some M, you can calculate everything explicitly. The quench is described by a Bogolubov transformation, okay? It's a little tricky to calculate magnetization in this model because magnetization operator is non-local is non in terms of the fermion, but you can do that, okay? It's, there are tricks, I mean, this is, a, the analytic results here are actually by Esler and Schurich using some form factor, using the same sort of form factor expansion. Okay, you need actually in the form factor expansion to get the analytic results, you need to do a resummation of certain terms. I will, I, I will come back to that later. Okay, so you need some sort of resummation of infinite sets of uh, contributions, but that's done. So this is, this is how it works. So what we do is that we just take the Hilbert space of this theory, truncate it at some energy level, keep those states and do the, do the numerics. That's the truncated space approach in, in, its, in its simplicity. And these are, these are lines with different truncations. M is the mass, lambda is basically truncation level in, 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 in energy. So M is unit of energy here. This is time in units of mass, or one over M. And this is, this is the so-called Loschmidt echo. First, Loschmidt echo is simply that you take the initial state, overlap with the time evolving state, and take its absolute value squared. That's Loschmidt echo for you. It's how well the initial state is preserved in time. What is the overlap with it after, uh, as time goes? And you see here that it depends on the cutoff. Uh, but we understand a lot about RG, which was also worked by, a diff uh, by many, many different people, so people in this, um, in this room like Slavarichkov and, and his group. And we can basically apply this machinery of RG to the Loschmidt echo and we can simply predict the exponent of lambda with which it scales. We can predict the exponent with the cutoff. Okay, that's simple. Uh, we could actually compute the coefficient as well, but it doesn't help too much. So, what so we just simply uh, predicted the exponent, which turns out to be minus one. So it scales as like, scales like lambda to the minus one, and then we just extrapolate it. And the curve here, the red curve, is the result of the extrapolation. But because this theory can be solved exactly, it's a free theory after all. We, we, we have these dots, which are the analytical results from Schurich and Nessler. And apart from this little part here, which we know what it is, it's a, trunc it's, a, it's a truncated conformal space artifact. There are some, because of the cutoff, there are, some, there are some little wiggles in the line and the extrapolation just doesn't work. It cannot catch these wiggles for short times, but it's the extrapolation is, 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 is going a little wrong in, 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 in here, okay? We, we see that the extrapolation do, doesn't, doesn't fit quite well, so we understand that what, what is that, but the rest is fine. Is that because you ensure if Nasser truncate the expansion that's written there, so do you think that that difference at short times is due to that truncation and that expansion? Uh, it's actually what, okay, how I know it's a truncation effect, it's basically, I can see these little wiggles which you don't see because the, it's, it's, it's not magnified there. But I see these little wiggles and then I look at their frequency. And their frequency is actually the cutoff frequency. And if I increase my cutoff, the frequency goes down. But the problem is that the wiggles don't fit together. If I increase the cutoff, then the wiggles will become, will, will become with the other frequency. So they, they just interfere with the extrapolation, basically. But this only happens at short times where the wiggles are still there. At long times, you already have deco decoherence of modes. And the wiggles, get, wiggles uh, get washed out and at long times, the extrapolation works much better, basically. That's the that's, that, that's, that's the thing that's happening here, okay? How, how big is this system? This system, this system is, is 40 in, in, in size of one, 1 over m. So, and this is the infinite volume results that I'm plotting here. 
okay? So also I can do magnetization. Again, these curves are the <laughs> truncation curves, so the dashed curves. How? Go back. Long time, you'd eventually see the periodicity of the system. Um, no, because no, 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 because there are some other effects uh, obscuring the periodicity. So actually, we are just going to have to have the volume to be safe, because basically because of the light cone, light cone effect. If you have any, if you have a finite volume, the light cone starts out at L over two, because my unit of uh, speed of light is one. At L over two, it is the boundary. Then my th th then my time evolution really deviates from infinite volume. Okay, <laughs> so then there, there there I would have a problem. Oh. But we are going to just to the half half the volume, okay? And here you see here, here you see the relaxation the relaxation of the of the magnetization. This is actually an exponential curve. It's just the first part of it, but it doesn't seem to curve too much. But we could actually fit the relaxation exponent from this curve directly, and it works. So this this is relaxation of magnetization. This is, this is in a ferromagnetic regime, so where you start with the spontaneous magnetization. After a quench, it relaxes. And the way it relaxes is described by the relaxation exponent, and you can fit it from this curve. And this works also quite well. We get quite, quite well the relaxation exponent that, that is predicted analytically. Okay, but here, okay, here there's a cheat line, which I don't say anything about this blue line, if you want to, you can ask later. I just don't want to go into where what, what we cheat here. We are we are cheating the TCSA a little, but the really vanilla TCSA is just or truncated Hamiltonian approach is just these lines extrapolated here with the appropriate exponent that we know from RG gives you the red curve, and then and then these dots are the uh, analytic results. Okay, but this may not be so convincing because after all, this is just. Uh, a free model with a Bogolyubov transformation. You would say maybe Bogolyubov makes life so simple that, I mean, after all, there is not much error in doing this, in all doing all this truncation. So the next is do non-integrable quenches. And the non-integrable quenches are basically the following. We are quenching from a free Majorana fermion, but the endpoint to which we are quenching also includes in this Hamiltonian another term which is an external magnetic field, or if you like it, in, in the Ising spin chain, quantumizing spin chain, people would call this the longitudinal magnetic field. This is the transverse magnetic field on the quantum chain, and this is the longitudinal magnetic field in the, in the quantum spin chain. Okay, so you can do this either in ferromagnetic and paramagnetic regime. And when we saw these plots, so the actual, actual the lines here are the truncation results. So these are really non-trivial, this is already non-integrable. When we saw these plots, we, we really said there should be something wrong. Maybe we are not going to sufficiently long times here because we saw no relaxation here. And actually, it turns out that here the relaxation is, is real problematic. I don't want to talk about the details of that again because that, that, that would lead us too far away. But in the ferromagnetic case, the relaxation, there is confinement, and confinement really interferes with relaxation. That's a, that's a topic, that would be a topic of a completely different talk, and uh, it's, it's in a completely different paper anyway. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> but <laughs> the point is that you have this, and at first you say this this just can't be right. This doesn't relax anywhere. I mean, if I continue this, you would see that this this wiggling continues, and then it comes back, and then it comes down. That that's already quite long times. So what we did is that we asked a, a guy who who already had the so-called ITEBD, which is infinite vo infinite volume time of all block decimation. I think uh, some of the ac actual experts are sit and sitting in this audience probably. <laughs> At least they are on the list. <laughs> and so, so Mario Colura from CISA to produce uh, spin chain results directly on the chain uh, using ITBD, which are the dots, okay, here. And you, uh, that, that, that's very tricky because in order to compare with the filter, you have to scale yourself as close to the critical point as you can, scaling all the parameters, whatever, where ITBD does all sort, uh, goes all sorts of heavy. Okay, so actually the filter calculation here takes something like, an, like, uh, like, like, like um, a few minutes, and the ITBD calculation here takes days. Okay, so filter here is much more effective. Obviously, it's, it's, in, it's in its own turf, right? But you see that the blue line 
The field theory line is very well on this line. And again, these little wiggles, now you see the wiggles there. Those little wiggles are actually truncation artifacts coming ma magnified by the extrapolation. Okay? They would be much smaller if I showed you the non-extrapolated line, but this is just the extrapolated result. And this is the paramagnetic phase where you see some very nice oscillations with a frequency of almost, I mean, the period is almost 2 pi, the frequency is almost 1. And that's actually the particle mass, the frequency. So this is just the one particle excitation that does this. And there is a very, very slow decay here, which is not obvious, but, but if, I, if I plotted more of this, I mean, the ITBD results are not, are not available for longer times. The TCSA results are available for longer time. If I plotted it for longer time, you would have seen the, uh, the decay. Okay. So now, you, now, now one grows more confident. This is, this is really going to work. Come on. Okay, so that's... Um, right. I think... Can I ask a question? Yes. So in the results, when you truncate in the field theory side, what it is that we are truncating, the number of states? Yes, so basically we use the same approach in the sense that we have the post quench hilbert space, <laughs> the post quench hilbert space, which is, which is the Hilbert space of this Hamiltonian without H. And we just truncate it in energy. And we represent the pre quench state on this Actually, we, we can do it numerically, or in some cases, we know the exact representation so that we can put in the exact vector. But we, but, but, but we did both, and it doesn't really matter. So the, the evolution is always by a free theory? No, that's the whole point. We are doing it on this Hilbert space, but we are to the Hamiltonian that we are actually doing. I mean, we are the basis of the free space. We are adding this. We are using the full Hamiltonian. That, that's the truncated conformal space idea normally that you are doing it in a sort of non-interacting conformal space. And then you are adding the interaction which you can't solve. But you know the matrix elements of this operator because you can solve for the exact matrix elements. So you can represent the ma Hamiltonian as a matrix on this space. And, uh, and, and, then, and then you just solve numerically for this time evolution. Uh, there, are some, there are some arcane tricks if you really want to get, uh, if, if, if you really want to be, be effective on, on in this. But, uh, but otherwise, it's a very simplistic idea. And then you have to take care about the cutoff. That's another thing. You have to add the RG. Without the RG, it wouldn't work. Gabor, but perhaps you should ask how many people in the room don't know about the truncated conformal space because I mean people from various approaches and in principle the first speaker I, I, I all right okay you want okay okay that little blackboard no. is, is, is more than sufficient uh, yeah so how, how, how many people do how many people need a lightning introduction to truncated Hamiltonian approach that's quite a lot okay so let's do it it's extremely simple you just take a Hamiltonian okay this Hamiltonian you know exactly you put it in a finite volume. The spectrum of this Hamiltonian is then ground state, excited states, whatever. It's discrete because it's in a finite volume. It's discretized. OK? So basically, there is some 0, 1, 2. This is states of this Hamiltonian. OK, this is not the pre quench Hamiltonian in this case, OK? This is just some Hamiltonian of which you know the exact solution. So you know it in finite volume. You know the spectrum in finite volume. What you do <laughs> is that you just take a cutoff, lambda, in some units, whichever, whichever units, some upper energy cutoff. If you put this in because you have a discrete spectrum, you, you retain only finitely num finite number of states. Next assumption that you really m must have is that you must know the exact matrix elements of this operator V in the space. In many cases, you know this from conformal field theory, from form factor approach, from different things. People computed this. You don't even have to understand this. You just take the book from the shelf and take the formula or whatever. Okay. So, you, so, 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 so here are these states n, and you have v and n. And what you do is just, then this becomes a huge matrix. 5,000 times 5,000, 10,000 times 10,000, whatever. It just depends on where you put your cutoff. And then the naive thing is just to take this as a matrix, this approximation for, uh, for the Hamiltonian in the finite volume. And then you just say, OK, well, we just do numerical quantum mechanics with that, matrix, quant matrix quantum mechanics. OK, it's very simple. Now, where all the tricky thing starts, for which this, this lecture wouldn't suffice, that would, that would be a completely different lecture, <laughs> but uh, is, that, is that then you want to get real results for really complicated models, for which, for example, this Hilbert space grows too fast, so that you cannot put a very high cutoff, or for which the cutoff dependence is very slow. So you would have to put a very high cutoff in order to get it well. 
And then you have to improve all this stuff by the normalization group methods. Basically, what you, what you compute is the dependence of your results on the cutoff. If you can have analytical predictions, analytical predictions come in different flavors. Sometimes you just know that your results, like an, like, like an expectation value, would be like the expectation value at infinite cutoff plus something like c to lambda minus kappa, where kappa is an exponent, and you know what is the exponent. Sometimes you can do such a detailed calculation that you even know c. Then you can even, then you can even just really, really get rid of this. You just subtract this dependence from your, from your results and see that they scale on top of each other. In, in, in the in the cutoff and all that. So this is really as, as simple as it gets. Simple-minded thing. The, I mean, all the trick comes in really first of all implementing um, efficient approach to this matrix computation, and the second is implementing uh, doing the RGE, which predicts you these exponents and possibly, if this is possible, also the coefficients of the cutoff dependence. Okay. <coughs> But uh, but this is but 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 this is all you have to think about. You don't need to do really all the other intricate details. So so in your example, it's key that the initial state was well represented in that subspace. Yes, very good. Yeah, actually that 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 already comes down to an interesting question: is that these k <coughs> these k amplitudes they depend on the rapidities. Basically, they depend on energy. And so they should be decaying with energy in order for it to be very well represented. And this is actually what happens. That's the whole point why it works. Because it, it's counterintuitive at first because the energy scale could be at infinity in a sudden quench. But what happens in normally in models is that, is that this thing here, normally, first of all, in many cases, which we call integrable quenches, this thing here is just factorized into two particle overlaps. So this is just product of two particle overlaps. That's, an, that, that, that's a non-trivial thing, whether it happens or not. It's not enough that the initial and the end Hamiltonian is, is integrable. The quench, the, this happens for specific quenches. For example, for the free to free quenches, this always happens. That's just Bogolubov transformation, why this happens, okay? And then the question is that this two particle overlap, let's call it K2, whether it decays with energy fast enough. Now. Energy is basically e to the theta because, because, because it's cosh theta. I'm neglecting the e to the minus theta, okay? So but what, what happens basically is that this k2 normally is a power of this, an inverse power of this. So in many cases, this is just more or less 1 over e squared, energy squared, 1 over, one over e to the 2 theta, okay? So it's a power-like decay. That's tricky. That's why you need extrapolation also because, because, because it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not fast enough. So you are really leaving out sizable chunks of your state from your Hilbert space. But fortunately, the chunks that you are leaving out have some very simple dependence in the energy. So you can extrapolate using, using this simple dependence. So yes, you, are, you, you, you do leave some, some parts of your state out of your Hilbert space, but you can, but, but, but you can get around that. That's, that's right. Yes? How is the map work from the multiparticle states that you were showing onto this? Onto this um... Yeah. So the so the normally if, if this happens if this this happens at all, this happens only when when you only have amplitudes like this. So this is the so-called pair state structure. When your quench state is just is, is just consisting of opposite momentum particle pairs. This is what is drawn in if, if someone if anyone is familiar with quant with the quantum filter quench formalism by Cal Cardi and Calabrese. This is what drawn like this that the Initial state in a quantum quench, which is here, time is going this way, is basically emitting particle pairs of opposite momentum. If this is true, then you can prove, this is a theorem which we, prove, which we, which we proved with Spiros Sotiriadis and Giuseppe Musardo, I think, yeah? Or maybe with David? I don't remember which paper the theorem actually was in. We, we, we have three papers about this, this, this problem, and, and I don't remember which paper we actually have the proof of the theorem. Well, it's a theorem. The theorem is that if this is, if, 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 if this is particle pairs, then basically your state exponentiates. Then your initial state can be written as integral of k theta, creation amplitude of particle pairs, like a squeeze state. This is what you would call an integrable quench. 
An integrable quench is not just that the initial and the end Hamilton is integrable. In integrable quenches, there is a recent paper by one of my uh, former students and uh, collaborators on this, Palash Poshgai, who uh, that this is what you would like. This is what you would really call an integrable quench. This is like factorization. It means that the multi-particle overlaps are factorized in terms of two-particle overlaps. Basically, they are products of independent two-particle overlaps. It's like it's like S matrix factorization in integrable models. It's like factorized scattering, more or less. Okay, if this is true, then there's a lots of things you can do with this. With, 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 this, uh, with this, for example, some TBA-like approach that Giuseppe Mussardo and De, uh, Davide Fioretti introduced long, uh, some time ago, and, uh, and things that you can do if, 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 this, is, if this happens. Okay? Why do you need all this in a numerical calculation? Why do you need to know all this? Uh, not in the numerics directly. You need it because, because you don't trust your numerics to start with, because of all the issues that I told you in the beginning. So you want to get an alternative approach. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that point. So you really, what you really want, you want to have something to compare with. And if you want to have something to compare with, it, 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 it should rather be analytically calculable. But can you, like, can you come up with a set of theoretical arguments independent of integrability which tell you when field theory works? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. So this is basically, this is basically, the, this is basically the, uh, the result of the following. Your interacting field theory, let me suppose that it is a relevant perturbation of a free boson or a free fermion. It, it works the same way. So it is basically at the ultraviolet, it's free. And then there's some relevant operator perturbing that leads you out of the critical point. The relevant operator at high energy is small. So your quench at very high energy is basically just quenching free to free. So you expect to reproduce at high energies, you expect to reproduce the asymptotic behavior of the free amplitude. That's it. It's the question is how high, obviously. So it, this can be far away, and then your and, and then your truncation method is not very effective because you can't extrapolate if, if this if it didn't yet set in, right? It's the question of quench uh, of, of the quench itself. I can also tell you that and 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 another, another, it turns out that uh, the truncated <laughs> method, the relevant small parameter that should be small is is actually the particle density post quench. So you should have a small post quench density in the units of the na in the natural units. Natural units is the mass again the mass related units of the smallest particle, and that is basically telling you that this amplitude per amplitude squared, when you integrate it over all the rapidity range, this integral should be small enough. So, um, so we worked this out in many cases, and uh, for example in the Ising case it turns out that in principle our truncated conformal space could work out to 300 units in volume. In field theory, that's huge because all finite size effects decay exponentially. Okay, so it, this is just a limitation of the time evolution, but the finite volume effects you can already forget. So the time, uh, time evolution is li limited because of the light cone effect, but otherwise, but otherwise as, 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 regarding the, as regarding the volume, this is fine. Okay, so this turns out to be the small parameter, the real small parameter in the game. And this means that your quench is, in a sense, small. Uh, this seems to be a real limitation. However, I would like to draw your attention that most theoretical approaches are limited to that. For example, there is the so-called semi-classical approach to quantum quenches in field theory, which is also limited to, to, to small densities. And the form factor expansion approaches are also limited to small densities. Can I ask you uh, a question on the K? Do you only, do you only have <coughs> sorry, excuse me do you only have uh, an even number of particles No that's also possible to have a, a odd number actually I'm going to show you plots from a theory which has odd numbers what could happen is that in this state besides this integral there is some some term like this so because the translational invariance if it's an if it's a single particle it can only be zero momentum so you can, you can have overlaps with, with, with single particle states, and then they have their own amplitude, g. We call it g normally, this amplitude. OK, and, uh, and, that's, and that's, that, that, that's also interesting. Actually, there are some all sorts of complications related to that. We are working on some of these complications right now because they are plugging all sorts of analytical approaches to quenches. So we want to understand more about this, about how this work, uh, how, how the quenches analytical approaches work in the presence of this coupling. It's not, it's tricky. Yes. So um, at the beginning you said that, that you expected the method to work for any massive quantum <coughs> field theory. No, I didn't expect it to work at all. No, no, no. <laughs> but I expect it to work for massive, that's right, massive 
with, cert with, with now certain qualification, which I, which I basically already spelled out. The basic qualification is that this sort of integral is small. But you also now said that uh, this would work if, if uh, the UV, there, there was a CFT, asymptotically a CFT. Would I said free theory. I, I, if, it's, if it's a CFT, then it's a tricky, if it's an interacting uh, CFT, then it's a tricky question. Right. Yes. So, so that's, well, that's why is this a tricky question? Uh, it, seem, it seems so. Is the interaction, is the, is the relevance of the interaction in the UV, no? Uh, because in, a, in an interacting CFT, you don't know what the overlaps would be. So you don't have the, the argument here depends very, very crucially that for, the, for a free theory, you be, have an explicit solution for the overlap. So we know that it decays. For an interacting CFT, I can't vouch for that. Okay, that's basically the problem. evidence that, that you can still go ahead and, and apply the approach? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I will show, okay? Yeah. So basically, you can, I mean, I told you about the damping here, and we can also extract the damping, and the damping calculate uh, the damping in this in this in this uh, paramagnetic oscillations. The data points, numerical data points, are the are the color dots, and there is an explicit prediction for the case when this is integrable. But the problem is that we are looking at the non-integrable, so we are taking small magnet small small values uh, values of this magnetic field, and we see as we scale this magnetic field to zero, then. They, they, they really try to fall on that line, okay? So this, is not, this isn't bad. So, 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 he, so even, that, he, even this damping, this very small damping that seems so small there can be extracted with very high precision from the curve. The curve is so precise that even a small damping can be extracted from it and, and, the, and agrees with theory. Right, yeah. So next, uh, I, uh, next, I, next, next, next I have to tell you what to do if you, if you don't have this, uh, simple-minded, free bogolyubov quench background uh, in, order, in, in order to have a, a theory behind this. So then basically what you do, it's on, it, 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 it's on the blackboard. You just evaluate this sum if you want to do analytics. You just evaluate this sum up to some terms. You have to be extremely careful there. You have to risk some certain orders in order to actually get uh, uh, get get to real results, but this can but but this at can be done in some approaches. So there are actually two approaches on the market. One was by Gesualdo Delfino in Sissa, and his approach is basically is that you quench from an integrable model from integrable to non-integrable. And on this side, because it's non-integrable, you don't actually know these form factors, you don't know the energies, you don't know nothing. But if it's a small quench from an integrable, you can think about this quench being perturbative. So you are doing perturbation theory around the pre-quench. You are doing a perturbation theory coupled with this expansion around the pre-quench. So you can do expansion around pre-quench. And actually, that expansion predicts very well the amplitude on that plot. The frequency R is wrong, and it cannot get the uh, decay rate well, but the amplitude is okay. Uh, there's a reason for that, actually. Maybe I won't have time to go into that. So the other, po the other possibility is, is, is by Esler and Schurich, and in combination with some people like uh, Bruno Bertini and maybe Axel Cubero this time. And, but basically, the, now, now, now it seems that Dirk is the stable person whose name you should watch if you want to get all these papers. And um, that is when you quench to an integrable theory. And in that case, you can use the post-quench exact form factors and everything. The only thing is that the integrable theory doesn't tell you the C's. So there are differences between the two approaches. Namely, first of all is what is the end state that they can treat. The other is that here, the K function, which is the C overlaps, K is input. But 
This approach is better in the sense that k is actually calculated perturbatively. I mean, this is not what Aldo really does, but it is effectively the same as calculating k as well perturbatively. Okay? So that, that because, because, because he's expressing everything in the prequench and do, does a perturbation theory, he actually captures all the, all, all the things in this expansion in perturbation theory and the prequench. The problem with his formalism that is already apparent is that it's going to be, it's going to be using the prequench energies, which means the prequench frequencies. And actually, the system oscillates in the post-quench frequencies. That, that, that already gives a sizable shift to his results. And there are, there, there, there are also some others. Such a form factor approach, because you are basically doing what? You are summing one particle, two particle, three particle states. It's the low frequency part of that. So it should work, first of all, for t long enough. So t must be long enough. t must be larger than the relevant gap. So all these truncated expansions work for a long time. For short time, they wouldn't work. This is, this, this is true for the second expansion. Let's call it the Schurich, actually, X slash Schurich, whatever, but I just say I, I will just choose one of the names. Let's call it the Schurich expansion. For the Delphino expansion, there's another limitation, is that because he's doing it, he's doing it perturbatively in quench, in quench size, let me call this quench size parameter lambda. There is some parameter lambda which specifies how big the quench is. Because it's perturbative, then he also has another limitation that he must stay below 1 over lambda because otherwise the, these, these things would, would come. Okay. So we did what we called, we did what we call the calculation of so-called E8 quenches. And here is what we have. So E8 quenches are quenches in this theory, which are already much different from this. M is 0. We are taking H, that's a free, famous E8 integrable model of Zamolodchikov, and we are quenching in H. So pre, -pre quench and post quench are both integrable. Both, both, both methods are applicable to this. And I think the results speak for themselves. So the TCSA curve in the upper figures is the red curve. This is the Esler Schubert expansion, and this is Aldo's expansion, Delfino's expansion. Okay? Actually, this is a very small quench. If I plotted a much larger quench, the result would be, the result would be even, even, even more pronounced. But, uh, but, but it's just not in a, that, that figure is not in the production stage yet, okay? So I don't have production quality figure about that yet. <laughs> okay, and, and this is, and uh, th this, these are basically, this is magnetization operator, and this is, and this is the uh, density of psi bar psi. This is a so-called epsilon energy density operator in the Ising model. Okay, so you see that this is this is another quench. So you see that first of all, what you see is that the TCSA is very good in the sense, in the following sense, it follows very soon. First of all, the Schurich expansion is also very good in the sense that even at very short times, the Schurich expansion is very precise. We are only keeping one particle pieces. Okay, we are not even going to two particles in these expansions. We are just keeping the first one particle pieces here. Okay? So to get, if you take together the truncated conformal space and the Schurich expansion, we basically describe this quench all to infinite times. Because the Schurich expansion gets even better if you go to if you go to higher times. That's not a problem for it. Okay? So we basically and and the only this the only difference here is, is is this little tiny part which you which you barely can barely see that the TCSA result starts from here but actually Schurich expansion starts as well. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, Shuri, uh, sorry, Delfino's uh, expansion starts as well, and Shuri's expansion come, uh, goes, goes here at the zero time. If you, pl if you place it together, then you, then, then, then you have basically an infinite time description of this quench. Okay, and for, and, 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 and for other quenches as well. So, yeah. If we quench away, Yeah. Okay. Just let me just let me tell you about the upper line because that's easy. What you can also do is that you keep H the same and you switch on M. That breaks integrability. That means we call it quenching away from the E8 line. Then we don't have the Schurich expansion because it uses post quench integrability. But then we have Aldo's expansion, which again doesn't perform uh, quite quite well. Okay. And the the upshot is. 
what I would say is not that it's not, to, it's not that we should throw it out. Not we sh you shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? The point is that this is, for the time being, this is the only expansion that would work for a post-quench non-integrable case. So I think it it has to be improved, and I think it can be improved. We have some ideas about how to how to go around that. So actually, so actually, I, I'm I'm hoping that this, that that instead instead of saying that this, this just disagrees, I'm hoping that we can get this curve. To, to, to line up with that with some improvement of the of the actual expansion it just needs to be needs to be done much in a much more <coughs> comprehensive way including including lots of other stuff in it okay yeah so that's so, so that's the end so let me just conclude so I think that for field theory quenches, first of all, they are interesting because we know much less about them than statistical mechanical quenches. I think this is true because and 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 uh, the, the the relaxation doesn't seem to happen so easily in field theories, and there are and, and there are less approaches uh, to really calculate field theoretic quenches. What I what, what I first want to say is that truncated Hamiltonian methods seem to be effective, at least for low density quenches. This is the real small parameter. If it's a low density quench, then, then the truncation method is, is applicable even, uh, even after all its limitations, that it has to work in finite volume, that it, has a, that it has a cutoff, whatever. Even after all these limitations, it is applicable. And I think that on the theory side, I mean, having analytical expansions, there are some very nice works, but, uh, but a lot more needs to be done because of their limitations. So basically, at this point, we don't have a good good analytical calculation when the post-quench theory is non-integrable. And this is one of the most outstanding questions. For when the post-quench theory is integrable, I think the Schurich expansion is, apart from little details maybe, but, uh, but, but the idea is fine. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but for the post-quench theory non-integrable, which is actually a very interesting case, obviously, the non-integrable case, we, we, we need to do much more in, uh, with the theory. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Questions? I didn't understand very well this part about the structure of the initial state. So, so for example, in this case where you quench to a final Hamilton which is not integrable, do you still claim that it has this structure? No, uh, no, I don't claim. However, however, there is an interesting observation: is that if the density is small, you can imagine that these particles are created far away from each other. So you can imagine that the leading part is still a more or less factorized particle pair creation. It's just that it's not, it's not exactly factorized. So for small densities, you can imagine that this is still a good approximation, even if the quench is not, not integrable. <laughs> so all this. And you can measure these k factors experimentally, by the way. Experimental, I would say TCSA. Experimentally in, trunc trunc in truncated Hamiltonian, you can not measure, numerically compute it. Okay? So the k factors you can numerically compute in truncated Hamiltonian approach. You can compute uh, just at the expense of here, here is such a computation with the theory on it. Okay. I, this is an integrable quench, but 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 you can do it in non-integrable case. So you can measure these overlaps. So you can check whether your actual assumptions about this integral being small is valid or not. You can check it in, right, right inside the approach itself. So it's a, it's an internal check. You don't need to know it from advance from from something else. What do you show in these plots? It's just it's just an overlap calculation, a k function, absolute value of a k function as a as 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 as, as momentum. You see you see the power light decay. It's an overlap between what and what? It's a, it's 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 actually it's an overlap in sine Gordon theory after a quench between the initial state and the two particles, two particle state, the lowest two particle state as the function of the of the momentum of the two particle state. And the blue line is a theoretical curve that we got together with Spiros Sotriadis and Giuseppe Musardo. The red line would be free theory, and the dots are the measured values of the overlaps. Okay. Just, I, I, but I don't, didn't want. To, I just want to say that this can be measured inside the approximation itself. So you can, you, you, you can, you can validate this approximation from inside. You don't need to know anything from outside about the overlaps. So, but this is to check two parts. But here, you, your statement was that it exponentiates, right? So you would have right. to check. Actually, you have to remember. You have to remember that smallness can also be checked from the following. The total, the total uh, overlap should be one because it's a normalized state. So if you check that your vacuum overlap is still sizable, that means that all the rest should be small. 
Okay, so that that validates your numerics. That it's, 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 it may be an even easier check. I, I told uh, I, I showed you something which is which is more, so to say, theoretically based. But uh, but but actually, if you just check that in the given volume, your vacuum overlap is still sizable, then 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 then, then you are on the safe ground. Actually, I had a question. So, okay, quenches are, uh, of course, fascinating. But uh, when you were working on quenches, did you, from the from the methodological point of view, did you learn something about the method, which you know could be used to improve its functioning even in other situations, not just as far as quenches are concerned, but in the classic applications of the method, which are spectroscopy. And then extending it to other theories, not just uh, the good old Ising CFT. Yeah, I learned more about the details of its validity. It turns out that validity for these uh, pro for these questions is, is the same as this one. So the validity criterion of TCSA is actually is the smallness of this sort of integrals. Because even then, you, there you are not doing quenches, but you have your you you, you have your H zero theory from which you start from, and that has a ground state. And then you are looking at the overlaps of this ground of of of, of the post uh, of this ground state with the post, uh, uh, I mean the perturbed excited uh, excited states, and they should decay fast enough, basically. And you can and, and you can you can even specify this in more details. You can even give the highest volume to which you can go with the, with 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 the, with, the, with the given cutoff. Uh, they you, you you can you can give. I mean, for example, in the Ising theory, in the standard Ising uh, truncation. I think one, what we can do is 300 in the volume. That's what I thought. It, 300 in the volume. That that is not a quench related thing. That is just TC uh, truncated Hamiltonian as its function, its its precision, is. And basically, we also learned. But we did, uh, but, but you already. I, I remember we discussed this. So you already guessed this yourself or observed this yourself. We learned about how the multi-particle overlaps are scaling with, with with parameters, and they are well. They are scaling. It's it's not too. Okay, I'm, there's not much time, but we can. But we, I, I can tell you in private. But it's, um, it, it's it's not too surprising. But we confirmed all that they are scaling in the proper way that you would expect in order for all these overlaps should should sum up to one. They should scale with the volume in some non-trivial way in order for uh, for this to be possible. Yeah. 